Okay, so welcome, welcome to Cardboard Construction, Project-Based Learning, and um, Computer Science Integration. So I'm going to just start with an overview. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself and my co-host, Alicia. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I love modeling, building, and projects using cardboard. I'll talk a little bit about community-centered design and what I mean by it and why I love it. And then we'll pop into this project. Um, if you have materials, um, you can play along and we're gonna have a, a chance to learn how you can code through play with this project. And Alicia is gonna share some uh, ways to level up the project with like not no tech, but real tech um, extensions as well. So for starters, hi, my name is Marcy Klein. Um, I'm actually a pediatrician and was a pediatrician for over 20 years before transitioning into education, um, inspired by a cardboard modeling set my kids invented. And I fell in love with architecture and engineering projects as a way to um, create great learning experiences for kids. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, you know, when I talk about cardboard, but I'll let Alicia introduce herself as well. Hi, I'm Alicia Verwe. I am a educator uh, still till this day. I am a certified teacher. I spent 17 years in the classroom. I've been out of the classroom for about three years now uh, with my own business now educating. I do consulting and professional development now and some curriculum writing as well. Um, and just absolutely have a passion for helping teachers um, make smart decisions for bringing ed tech into their classrooms. Um, my specialty is project-based learning and STEAM integration. Thanks. Okay, so to pop into cardboard for a second, why I love cardboard so much. First and foremost, it is incredibly fun. Not only do all kids love building and playing with cardboard, but now that I've had about six years to do professional development, I can officially say that teachers love playing with cardboard as well. Um, it's open-ended, um, it's free. So whereas maybe having robots or um, a laptop for every one of your students isn't possible in some communities, Pretty much everybody has access to cardboard, so it really can even the playing field for good, authentic STEM learning, no matter where you're from or what resources you have available. Um, putting on my stethoscope from a pediatrician and developmental perspective, it's great for fine motor and 3D spatial thinking. Um, jumping down to the bottom one, academically, Based on the projects, you can incorporate literally any subject in school into a cardboard building um, project-based learning experience. So you can hit language arts, math, science, civics, computer science, as we'll do today, technology, and like any other subjects that I left out, SEL, like you name it can be done through project-based learning with cardboard. And then holistically speaking, it hits all of those 21st century human skills. So kids are building together, they're collaborating, they're communicating with each other, they're coming up with critical problem-solving solutions through hands-on modeling and prototyping. And of course, um, it's the ultimate in creativity because there's no preset rules, no preset shapes. It's like pure creativity. Um, so community-centered design are projects that I tend to focus on. Um, community-centered design is a term I sort of came up with myself because in creating projects, I learned about human-centered design. And I've always thought that human-centered design is a little selfish and myopic. And I kind of think of human-centered design, a perfect example of human-centered design is single-use plastic. It serves a very great purpose for humans, but it pays absolutely no attention to the rest of the community, which is the animals, the plants, the geography, the climate, and everything else that becomes a part of our community. So by thinking about community-based projects and challenges, we're teaching our students to really think about like what we can create and problems we can solve on a more global um, and inclusive manner. I'm just gonna let one more person in. Um, but through these projects, we're also talking about engineering, architecture, the environment, we're hitting science, we're doing creative storytelling, 
course, we're using math when we're building. So literally every subject is a part, can be incorporated into a community-centered design project. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more focused about how we can incorporate coding um, into a community-centered project. So I created this project called the Global Goals, which is a tech-free coding game, but we're also gonna talk about ways you can actually level up. So as Alicia reminded me, not everybody knows what global goals are. So I'm gonna let you talk about that a little bit first before we jump into the actual game. So um, sustainable development goals is specifically what she's speaking of here. And these were developed um, in conjunction with the UN. And it's basically goals that are focused on how do we develop with a more um, kind of conscious in mind, right? As we come up with things, how do we make sure that we're keeping things like our water, our environment, our air in mind so that when we are really developing things, we make our world more sustainable. That in a nutshell is what they are. There are 17 different sustainable goals that are out there. Um, Three Ducks does a fabulous job of incorporating incorporating these into basically every lesson that Marcy does. By the way, I've been a user of Marcy's products since I was in the classroom. Um, and I can tell you, she has always done a fabulous job with this. Um, so if it's something that you're interested in and you really want to incorporate, I encourage you to look at some of her other lesson plans along with this one, um, just to kind of get an idea because she naturally sort of encompasses these in all of her lessons. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Global Goals game basically, oh, let me go back a second. So the Global Goals game is basically a board game. Um, and by creating a grid patterns board game with um, basically spaces that kids need to either hit or bypass and other spaces that they need to avoid, they're essentially going to code their journey. Um, so through this project, they're gonna be creating structures that support sustainable development goals. And they're gonna be creating structures that are considered a hazard to attaining sustainable development goals. And as the students, as teams build their city, um, the first part is learning about the goals and building the city. The second part is coding their journey. And we're going to go through multiple levels of like from your preschool kindergartners all the way up to your middle schools. All can be done without even using an electronic or a device or a robot if, if you want. Um, so the basic core learning goals to the project are one, learning about the sustainable development goals. But more importantly than just learning about them, um, in context of their own of students' own community, so how the sustainable development goals are supported and potentially challenged within their own community, um, and then they're going to build a city. So they're doing this, you know, project-based learning and model making, and then at the end, they're going to actually play the game and code their own journey. I'm sorry. Oh, someone said something, but I don't know. Were you talking to me or? Just... Andy had unmuted, but I, I'm not sure if she, if they were talking to us or not. Okay. Well, I'm, oh, I always usually say I'm, I, I live in Connecticut, which is very civil, but I'm from New York, which is very uncivil. So I'm used to constantly being interrupted. So if anybody has a question that they're dying to get out, just you know, bellow it out. I'm not always looking at the chat, but I have Alicia here. So, um, but either way, feel free if, if you're lost or need explanation, like unmute yourself and, you know, chime in or you have ideas too. Um, okay, so extensions of the project beyond the basic learning goals, we can include digital literacy through students researching the sustainable development goals. Um, we can incorporate life and environmental uh, science, um, civics and climate based on the goal that they got. So if you haven't downloaded the project, you're going to get little game pieces, um, one game piece for every one of the 17 goals. So based on um, the card that the student picks, they're going to research that sustainable development goal. So, but all together, cumulatively, you're going to be addressing all different types of subjects through the specifics of the goal. 
Um, they can do community-based research. So maybe they don't know what structures in their community um, do support or don't support sustainable development goals. So they can add digital data collection, um, community outreach, getting interviews from people in their town. So it's a great way to incorporate data collection and analysis. Um, we can level up with electricity circuits, renewable energy kits. Alicia will talk a little bit about how we can incorporate real robots. And then the concept of game design and like adapting the game as it is to meet the students' needs or interests. Um, details about the project, minimum two to three class periods, but based on how you want to extend it, it can go on for many hours. Um, you will find ISTE and specifically computer science standards. I aligned it for grades two through five, but it's flexible enough. You can go up based on you know the specifics of your, your state and the age group. Um, I have a facilitator guide that you'll have access to be able to download and print printable game pieces and a Google Docs version of the game. So if your students do have access to use Google and they have laptops or iPads, they can actually play a digital version of their game. Um, so there's a link, you're gonna copy the original document and then you can share it with your students and they can each have their own way to kind of like map it out on, um, on, on, a, on a laptop. Um, and then there's gonna be this video tutorial will be added to the webpage as well. So you'll be able to access that. Um, for materials, um, so if the Three Ducks Design kits, if you don't know what Three Ducks Design is, um, it's these connectors that work um, to create complex cardboard models, but you do not need them. So any modeling material, you could do cardboard with duct tape and glue, you could do magnet tiles, you could do Lego. Um, in the download, I gave you some sheets that are like paper buildings. This one makes a yurt, but there's also square houses. So your students can use paper crafts to build their structures. Um, you're going to download the facilitator guide and the game pieces. I have a mat that I've created um, that's three feet by six feet with six inch squares. Um, so you can get that, but you can also use origami paper. I like the six inch square because the structures that we create are typically five inches, so they fit within one space, but you can scale it up and down based on what materials that you're using. But you can on Amazon get, I think about 500 pieces of colored origami paper for under $10. So if you wanted to use origami paper and lay it out, I like the six by 12 um, grid, so it's 72 pieces, but you know, for preschoolers, you can do much smaller. And if you're working with, you know, high school students, you could kind of go on forever. Um, any robot, if you want to incorporate robots, but Alicia is going to talk a little bit about the best robots to use. Um, if you wanted to buy wind power, solar power, elect, um, motors for little like characters running around your city, you can get those. Um, on our site, or you can just get paper circuits and stuff, you know, other, you know, you might even have some of this material already available. And if you have laptops, you could do the Google um, Docs thing. Um, so I mentioned before, but basically you're going to build a model of um, all the different sustainable development goals. There's 17 goals, and I included three hazard cards. The hazard cards you can see actually on the image, there's one with an a red X on it. I picked three um, goals that I put an X through, but if they don't make sense in your community or you want to create your own, you can do that as well and change up the game a little bit. I start with 17 goals because that's how many goals there are and three hazards. Um, and then students are basically going to um, create a character they can make one or they can use a little toy if they want and they're going to navigate um, using the game pieces um, to navigate their journey um, to a sustainable future. Um, so setting it up, um, you're going to make your map first. So either you're going to use your origami paper or if you have a three ducks mat, you're going to lay that out. 
I recommend teams of two, but you can easily do three or four based on the age group and you know what you're comfortable in your classroom typically doing. Each team is going to select a card. They're going to research their goal, and then they're going to build a representative structure. So um, equity and diversity. Um, so if you look at the picture on the left, that building to the bottom left is cultural connections. It's a place where people can share their culture, their arts, um, their cuisine. So it's meant to kind of create a, a safe space for people to share their own culture. So that's what one student created for that. You'll see through these projects, other ones. Um, next to it, the one with the X um, is a little prop plane that's spraying chemical pesticides over the water. So those are just examples of one that supports and one that's a hazard based on this community. Um, and then here again is your opportunity for digital research at the bottom. I have links to, the first one is a resource of resources. So if you don't know where to research sustainable development goals, you go to that one and that will tell you based on if you want your students to read, if you want them to watch a video, what age they are, what's the best resource for your students to learn. And then I added a YouTube video that I like that summarizes the sustainable development goals, but you can incorporate your own research if you want. Um, the rule is the structures that the students built have to fit on one square. So if you use a six inch square, it can't overhang their six inch square. It has to be within there. So again, there is an opportunity for some math applications. Um, the structures on the board are basically going to be populating the city. And then once the city is done, each student will, or actually each student or team will create a character and then they're going to have to agree on a few rules before they actually play. And we're gonna talk about the specifics of what the, the rules will be. And some of it will be scaffolded based on the students. Marcy, so, mm -hmm. we have someone in the chat asking the two links that you just had on that prior slide, if you could throw those in the chat. Um. Yeah, can I, yeah. Let me see. I don't know if I, I don't, I'm not sure if I can, I can, you know, Alicia, can you, um, let me see. How do I do that? I don't know. I don't think I can. Oh, I can click on it. Oh, okay. This is not so hard, <laughs> but I will, um, I can also, I'm going to be sharing this presentation with you as well, but I can appreciate that. It might not be so easy to, um, Text that or type Teachers, that in. Let's face it; it's not always easy. Oh, sorry. Students focus. That's what you happens. That's the YouTube video. Education.com. <laughs> yeah, it, you clicked it, so it's probably playing in the background. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I just put those two links in. But if anybody needs anything, like reach out to me directly, and I can always get you more stuff. Um, okay, so how you're going, so here's where the rules come in. Now, when your students build a structure, um, like any building, there are any number of ways to get into the structure or get inside. So starting with your youngest, youngest students, say your preschool, kindergarten, in that case, I would have the students coding their journey. And what I didn't mention is they're coding their journey with arrows. I should have mentioned that. So in picture number two, you can see the arrow cards. These arrow cards are part of the game. So we have four different colors, four different directions. For the youngest, the arrows can all be the same. It doesn't matter what color they are, but I'll go through that a little bit. But basically they're putting the arrows on the board to map out their journey. Um, so your youngest students, if you're not using a robot, they can literally land on top of the structure. So say this is a structure that your students built. Um, a robot would have to go through it but a little game piece character, like somebody like this would not have to like go through it. They can go on it. So in that case, the rule can be, you know, you just land on that space. Or if you pass the space, you would be able to say you collected that goal card. Um, but if you want to play it a little bit more complicated for your older students, third, fourth, fifth grade, we can determine um, the rules based on how they built the structure. So this is a solid structure. There's literally no way to get in it. So this would be like the picture number one, which is based on like um, justice. It's a jailhouse and a courthouse and a jail. Um, so in that case, they can't actually get inside because a robot would never be able to get in there. 
Um, so that we represent as like a solid structure. The students have to code around that structure anywhere along the perimeter, but they actually can't go through that house. So they can't actually go onto that game, that game location. Um, picture number two is a completely open structure. I don't actually have one here, but I do have one that looks sort of open. So like, say there's like two entrances and two exits, they can use all four directions. Um, that would count as you can go around the perimeter of that structure, or you can actually literally land on it and go right through that structure. So it makes it a little bit easier to code your journey because you have more choices. And the third one over is more like a railroad style house. Here's an example of one like that that I have. Um, so you can go in and you can go straight, but you can't make a right or a left. So that limits the, the, the movements of their character. And then the fourth one over here is a triangle with three entrances. It'll, based on the way they orient it, um, will dictate the directions that they can go. Um, but I represent that with like a letter T. Now there are other pathways um, and options that the students can create. They can make only a right angle. So they might need to, um, you know, create a new shape if they want. Maybe an L would, you know, would work for that shape. Um, so these are examples of different um, ways the structure of their buildings are, you know, affect the way the students will play the game. Sounds good. Um, so different ways to play. Um, so as I said, each player is going to code their journey. They're going to use direction cards to code their pathway. Um, they can start anywhere on the board and they can end anywhere on the board, but their goal is to collect bypass or directly hit um, all of the sustainable development goals that are on the board and avoid all hazards. Um, so if they land on a space adjacent, and here's a way to add geometry along the perimeter or directly on top of it, they win that, that point. Um, if they go directly on or bypass anywhere along the perimeter of a hazard, they lose um, and they have to start over. Their, their journey is not successful. Um, I put in the instructions recommending that they have up to 24 moves um, to collect all of the sustainable development goals and avoiding all hazards. Um, but depends on the age group, you know, and how many structures are on there. And um, if you can just say like, who can do it in the fastest way possible with the, with the fewest moves or the most efficient. So you can kind of play with that based on, you know, how you want to run it in your class. Um, ways to level up. I'm going to start with the easiest. Um, you start with arrows, and I wish I printed them out ahead of time, but I do have one here. Like, so this is one example of arrows. Um, they come in different colors. The front page gives you the instructions. So the different four different colors are straight, um, right, left, and backwards. Um, for the youngest students, I would recommend they're playing right on the board. They're putting their game pieces directly on the map and don't worry about the colors. Let them just get it down so that they can pass all the sustainable development goals and avoid the hazards. The youngest put fewer buildings on the city so that it makes it a little bit easier for them. And then you can always level up by adding more and more cities as they get, you know, as they master it. Um, level number two is you pay attention to the colors and you either use the colored dots or the colored arrows, but they have to be representative of the direction that they're supposed to be. So now the color, the, the, the colors represent a direction. So it's one level harder for your students. Um, the third version is a printed map that is on paper. And your students actually have to document on that sheet of paper where they have to map it out. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. And then they have to draw on the paper their journey. And then they can use a pencil and erase it and keep doing it till they get the best pathway. Or I recommend give them a couple pages 
because if they're attempt number two, they were successful in 12 and then they kept trying and trying, they'll never remember what attempt number two was. And then they'll be all frustrated because they'll be like, I know I got it in 12, but I can't get it back. So giving them multiple copies might be helpful for that. Um, level four, we want to add some technology. Um, you could use the Google Docs app. Hold on, somebody's in the waiting room. Um, level number five, adding circuits, motors, LED lights, and robots. And then level number six would be, we played this game. It's totally fun, but it's too easy for us and we want to make it harder. So maybe your students want to say, you know what, we can't land on these structures, but maybe we can create bridges and you could do like, if then. So, you know, if they land on a space right in front of them, a hazard, Maybe they can go up, around, and over, or maybe they could make a game like kind of like Mousetrap and add simple machines and like I can catapult over it. Um, so lots of different, I mean, that's just one example. Maybe they don't like the global goals as a theme and they want to do like a nature preserve and a hike and avoid the bears. So, you know, it's just an inspiration for many different kinds of games and projects that they can create from this basic, um, you know, outline of the project. So to the right, if you have a phone, um, you can click on it. You won't be able to play the Google Docs on the phone so easily. But what I did was I recreated in this document, I already mapped out what's a hazard and what like the pathway options are based on the structure. So it's an exact replica of the city that I created. You'll use that. So like with this video for your own personal training, um, but on the website, the link will be a blank Google Docs um, map with no structures. And that's the one your students will use because they're gonna create their city however they want. Um, but I'm just using this as an example to represent the city I created. So here's what the Google Docs would kind of look like as I am like setting out the map. So I put a green square on structures that I need to go around. I can't go in, um, but those are goals that I want to bypass. The pluses are awesome. I can go through them. I can make a right. I can make a left, like the ultimate in directions that I, I can go any direction I want. So that's going to shorten their pathway. The straight line is I can only go like straight. I can't make any turns. And then I have a T over there. The X's I put in there, those are the hazards, avoid at all costs. Um, and here you see it a little bit clearer without. What I did, because I had a hard time doing this on paper, um, I actually put like red boxes in all the squares that I know I can't hit. So that way, like, I won't even like, there's no way I'm going to die because I'm not going to hit any of those because I just like kind of blockaded them. Um, that was like how I came up with a way to kind of get around making sure I didn't hit a hazard, but your students, you know, can come up with their own ideas. Um, and here's an example of a journey. So the students started smartly next to a sustainable development goal because there's no point in wasting a space not being right next to a goal. And then they coded their journey. Um, they made a right in a location where they could, and then they made another, they made the left and they kept going straight. Um, and then they ended at the last sustainable development goal. So as you can see in this journey, they hit all the goals that are on here and they didn't hit any hazards. So that's a win, but maybe their next door neighbor did it in fewer moves. So um, it's a fun little competition. Um, what was I gonna say something else? Oh, there are ways, like you can set this board up. So there's literally no way to win. Like if somebody put like all of the hazards, like. Uh, like across the board, like you wouldn't be able to get from one side of the city to the other without hitting a hazard. That's a learning experience for your students. It's not like a failed experiment. It's a success because they just figured something out. Wow, we can't line them all up in a perpendicular way. That's sure death for our, you know, for our community. So that's a learning opportunity for them. And because it's a game and play, like, it's not like, oh, we failed. It's part of the journey. Um, so I'm going to move over to Alicia now. 
So she's been talking about coding quite a bit and we haven't had any robots. So what we call that is pseudocode. And that's really important to know because that is a term that is used, especially if you deal with ISTE standards um, or you follow that, or if you're in with um, CSTA standards and you're kind of in those beginning stages of learning to code, part of that is really understanding the basics of coding before we get into actual coding. So pseudocode is what she's talking about doing here with the arrows and, and the pathways before you're getting into tech. Um, and it does involve a process just like the process of coding involves. Um, they have to use logic. They have to evaluate their path. They have to make predictions. They are using an algorithm. It's a series of steps. They have to look at patterns and things that they have to recognize. Um, they are decomposing a problem and they are abstracting what information they need to use, what information is relevant, what isn't. So all of this goes into pseudocode just as well as it goes into regular code. Um, Marcy, if you'll advance to the next slide yeah. for me. Sorry, just answering the question there. Okay. And that brings us to talking about computational thinking. Um, any type of coding, whether it be with a robot and using technology or whether it be pseudocode, you are getting into computational thinking. Computational thinking is huge and is really something that we should be dealing with and teaching our students to do um, in every lesson that we're teaching at this point if we're really wanting to prepare them for the future workforce and college and career, regardless of whatever path they take. Computational thinking is basically dealing with complex problems, being able to break them down and come up with solutions to those problems. Um, and then we want to be able to present the solutions in a way that now, because technology is such a big deal in our everyday lives, how can we break this down in a way that a computer would be able to take this and then do something with it? Because we see now machine learning, AI, and what a big part these are playing in everyday society, right? So the big components are decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction, and algorithm. And if algorithm is a word that scares you, it's nothing more than a series of steps. That's all we're talking about there. Um, so don't let the word algorithm freak you out. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. I'll just interject for like the first three years I knew Alicia, I was afraid of this whole, like not even just like the <laughs> algorithm was the easy one. It was like the whole process. Like she was very patient with me figuring out what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny part is she does it in all of her lessons. So it's really just understanding the terminology and what you're doing. So, you know, breaking this down a little bit further, the benefits of computational thinking is um, the confidence in being able to deal with more complex problems, really giving our students that boost of confidence to know that they can go out and they can solve real world problems. You know, we hear a lot about diversity and equity and the digital divide. This plays a big part in all of that because we're never going to close those gaps if we really don't arm them with the confidence to be able to do that. And computational thinking is really the key in doing that. Um, persistence in working with difficult problems. You know, we hear a lot about grit and not giving up and, you know, the way we're training their minds. Computational thinking is that tool. Tolerance um, really goes into this, learning how to basically tolerate working with others, working in a group, right? Conflict resolution, um, managing open-ended problems, and then the whole aspect of communicating for the purpose of a common goal. That's where we really see that collaboration piece. We're all working toward the same goal at the end. How do we all work together to get there to solve that one thing? Um, and while we're doing that, we're doing these four components. We're decomposing. We're literally just breaking the problem apart to figure out what is it that we're trying to solve. We're identifying if there's any patterns, any repeating things that we need to take notice of. Are there any sequences that we need to be acknowledging here? Um, we abstract is basically we're just pulling out that data. 
This is what they're doing every single day in math class. It's what we all did when we were growing up. We're just putting fancy terms to them, right? So we're abstracting the data. This is where, you know, how many times were you sitting in math class and you're reading the word problem and the teacher's like, okay, figure out what information you need and what information's garbage. That's your abstraction. That's the process you're doing here. And then lastly, you know, what is it that you're doing to actually solve the problem? So what equation are you going to apply here? What tools are you going to use to set out your steps to ultimately solve the problem? Go to the next slide. And that brings us to why we're doing computational thinking, why we need to be learning about sustainable development goals. It all connects to Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is the term that's being used now to discuss what industrial revolution we are in. Um, we have gone through a series of them, and we are now saying we're in the fourth. Some argue we're in the fifth, but widely speaking, the general is we're in the fourth. Um, and this is the age of artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, Internet of Things, cloud computing, all these fancy tech terms. And... In short, it is, we've got technology everywhere, but on the flip side of that with sustainable development, we need to begin understanding what responsibilities comes with all of this, right? And how do we make sure the students are prepared to make good decisions as all of these things are happening around them? So all of this connects together to make Industry 4.0 and to be sure that we're preparing the students adequately for it. Next slide. And with Industry 4.0 in education, we are calling it Education 4.0, right? Big leap there to make that connection. Um, the key things that are the focal point of Education 4.0, and we're really seeing that shift in most of the classrooms and media centers now, is problem solving, collaboration, and adaptability. So Yes, it's still important that we're teaching those core skills, but if you aren't really also making sure that you're teaching students how to do real world problem solving, how to apply those core skills in the real world, how to work with others and be adaptable while they're doing it, those skills are basically going to be more or less useless to them in the real world when they get to it, right? Because so much is happening that a revolves around all of those skills, they need to be able to implement them with these other soft skills or what we're calling now, we're hearing the term power skills, all the same thing, but this is the focal point. So this game that she's talking about really encompasses all of this in such a fun way where the kids really don't even realize all of these components are coming together but they are. And for the teacher, it's such an effortless thing to be able to do. And I, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but that's really one of the things that I love about the lesson plans that Marcy repeatedly puts together is that it's so seamlessly done all the time that it just makes it easy in the classroom for you to implement all of these things in, in one fell swoop. Advance to the next slide. Okay, so my turn. So other ways to level up um, the project. So, you know, when I was creating content, teachers were like, well, what standards, what standards? So I really, as much as I love community-centered design and holistic, authentic, real-world problem solving, I know we also have to teach to the standards. So there's lots of ways that you can, like you've already done this awesome project, like why not take advantage of it to incorporate some other projects? Um, so I'm just gonna kind of give you examples, but if anybody, like if one of these is exciting to someone and they wanna link to that project, they are all on my website, but I can help you like direct you. Um, so you can incorporate geometry and financial literacy into this project. By simply having your students calculate the area, the service area, like the material that they needed to build their structure and what materials they actually were using. I mean, obviously they're using cardboard, but what was it representing? Like, was it wood? Was it stone? Is it steel? How much per square foot that material costs and how much it would cost to build their structure? So if you want to add some financial literacy and geometry this would be a great project to be able to calculate all those, you know, the geometry and then attribute it to how much it would cost to build. And then they could do a little competition like who built their structure for the cheapest. 
Um, you can add solar, wind power, motors, um, LED lighting. So we do a fun project with smart lighting. So maybe you would want to incorporate like as the character passes the space, they have to make the light go on. So here's one example of how something like that could look if I can get in here. So this is a complete circuit that's interrupted. And then we put some copper on the little character's butt. And when he walks up, he sets the light on. So like your older students can incorporate that into the game. And it's not just like bypassing the structure, but they have to actually land on the space that makes the light go on. Um, this does not directly tie to the project, but it sure is a lot of fun. And kids love making these. So you could bring your city to life. Um, but maybe this would be the animal refuge in one of the squares and they make little characters. So these are mini motors um, that create a circuit and it's a vibrating motor and it makes these little guys move. So that would be a really fun way. It's a simple electrical circuit, but kids love it. Um, picture number three is um, solar power. Picture number four is wind power. So we have windmills that you can incorporate. Um, this can be a little challenging engineering when you're working with cardboard because you need a blow dryer. So your <laughs> students have to make their structures like sturdy enough to stay on the ground and not blow away. But that's a really fun way to level up as well. These are all going to go off. Okay. And say you want to add um, like media and technology into your project. So each student or team is learning about their sustainable development goal. They're building their structure create an advertisement, make a video, do a like, you know, like a PowerPoint presentation about that goal, whatever they want to do. Um, here's an example of um, a project that was based on the Trans-Canadian um, Highway and Animal Bridges. So these students did, um, hold on, I don't know why my cursor never gets to the right spot. There we go. So they wanted to show how, um, you know, highways aren't just dangerous for people, but also for animals. And that animals crossing the highway don't only kill the animal, but can actually harm people as well. So the Trans-Canadian Highway it was a bridge project. They were doing bridge engineering, but they wanted to create a video to explain the problem in a very poignant and like, you know, very graphic way. So they did a stop motion video which involves Hue, I think, camera. And I used, I think, iMovie for it, but you could use Wii Video. But it's a great way to incorporate technology into this project um, if you want. This is a page of like my website and where a lot of these lesson plans are. Um, but I can kind of walk anybody through it if they want, like separately. Um, but up there is the website and um, a link to the di directly to the global goals game. But I will be emailing you the link to the game. But when you click on the game, like you'll get like all the downloads, um, the lesson plan, the standards, the game pieces. You can cut out everything that you need to play the game, except for like, you know, the modeling materials and um, like the origami paper if you want that. Back to Alicia for the next level up. So I just jumped off camera. She mentioned Hugh and I just happen to have one sitting over here. So if you guys haven't seen that, it's another cool little thing. Hugh Animation Studio, if you like stop motion, it's under a hundred bucks. I actually love those little kits. They're great. Um, they have built-in scenes in the back and they're plug and play. So if you want to explore stop motion, it's a great way to do that with your kids. Um, so back to her um project here the leveling up with bots a couple of bots uh that i'm going to talk about is kaibot you can see him here he's really small oh i'm sorry sorry Oops. i was trying to stop the video <laughs> give you a comparison to my hand so he's about the size of the palm of my hand so he's pretty tiny he does have a screen he's screen free coding you use cards with him he works great with the mat um Bluebot is another. Now, Bluebot is rather big. He's great for younger students. All the buttons are on the back. With Bluebot, you would only be able to go around your structures with hers. Um, he is basically going to take up her whole square. So this is great if you're, you know, dealing with younger kids and you're trying to simplify things. 
um, and you really just needed to be sort of, they pass by their structures, you could use Bluebot. Um, and then you have Ozobot is a great one. If you're not familiar with him, he's super tiny. He will work with it as well. He's going to go through basically any structure. This is the Evo, the newer ones. Um, and then the other option, now this one is going to get a little bit trickier, and I would suggest older students, um, if you're going to use him, and he's right the market, I don't know if you guys can see him, he's Kubo, and the thing that gets tricky about him, and this is kind of hard to show on camera, but his wheels are just slightly bigger than the bot, so the bot himself fits within the square. The wheels are going to be a little bit larger than the square itself when you move three spaces. So he gets a little bit tricky to work with. He does work with little magnetic program square tiles is how you program him. So you can also do screen free with this bot as well. But the complicated component with him, like I said, is gonna be them figuring out how many moves to make with him because his measurements don't fit quite as nicely um, inside the square. So they have to work with him a little bit more to get that to work. So if you wanted to add a little bit extra level of challenge, Kubo is a great way to do that. Um, so these are three bots that um, I like in term four bots actually that I like that can work with this project if you wanted to level up with bots. My, my favorite is actually the Kaibot. Um, anything that's made in Europe is based on millimeters and the 15 millimeters happens to be six inches, which is why I picked the six inch grid um, because our structures, I mean, our product is based on five inches. So it just seemed to work well. But if you're using, a, say you have a different robot and it's natural distance is different, you can make your grid based on that distance instead. Like I pick Kaibot because it works with my product, but um, like the project itself is product agnostic and you just can scale up and scale down based on the model. So if you're like doing Lego and you want like a smaller map, you can do that. The, the like, the, you know, the structures might be smaller. So you might get away with a smaller, a smaller scaled city, um, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, that's basically um, the workshop. Stacy, the video is showing Kaibot. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been asking going back in the forth. video. That is, and I out. actually coded it, which is like my <laughs> first like time coding. <laughs> um, and I didn't even use all the cards because it was getting too complicated for me. I just stuck with like exact arrows and like I know that you can turn around and you can like dance and do other stuff. Um, but I was, I was not that ex like interested in, in, in expanding my coding. I'm, I'm more of a tech free coding fan personally. <laughs> um, so, but in any way, um, so that's the conclusion of the project. So if you're planning on using 3DX materials for this project, um, we recommend the GoBox Classroom, which is on the top left that works for a class of up to 30 students working at one time. Um, if you want to incorporate LED lighting into the project, the GoBox Pro would be the next one. Um, and then if you scroll down um, over to the right is the global goals map that I used for the project, um, which is three foot by six foot and includes all of the game pieces as well. When you purchase the kit, you will get a link to the actual lesson plan that goes with it, where you'll find all of the resources that you need to do the project in your classroom. Here, so here's like an overview. Here's a, that's like just a promo video, but the real video will be here. There's the lesson plan, suggested materials. I mean, here I have our products, but like I already went over with you the other materials you could get. Here, if you want to print your own game pieces, you can. Um, here are all the standards based on the different age groups. And then here is the link to the digital game. If I click on that, um, you have to make a copy. I don't, can you see this Alicia or is it still the, and then this would be the game. So here's where your students are going to like move their pieces based on how they set up their city. And then they're gonna use the the pieces to like code their journey, if that makes sense. 
So if you want to learn more about 3 Ducks Design materials in this project, you can reach out to me directly at marcy at 3 ducksdesigncom And if you want to learn more about education technology applications in this project or any other um, maker or project-based learning um, lessons in your classroom, you can reach out to Alicia at A V E R W E I J at educating.com.